reading in verse 10. Paul says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. I want to just read a couple of verses more to you from 2 Corinthians 5, and we'll have the words on the screen for you. Paul says, We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad. Over the past couple of months, we've been sharing with you about things unseen. The Bible says that the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So we've been taking time this summer to fix our eyes on things that are unseen, and this is the last sermon in our series. It's important to know what the Bible says about these things and about heaven and about hell. In recent weeks, Pastor Glenn shared with you about those important subjects. God wants us to have the truth on those matters so that we won't be deceived. But before we leave this set of messages behind, there's one more key aspect of our future that we do need to examine. We need to look at what the Bible says concerning our judgment and rewards. I want to share with you this message today called Joyful at the Judgment Seat of Christ. Joyful at the Judgment Seat of Christ. Let's pray and ask God's help as we look into the Word of God together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the wonderful name of Jesus, and we thank you so much for giving your Word. It is truly a lamp for our feet. It's the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God was like seed. And so, Lord, we pray that our hearts may be good soil in this time to receive and retain and bear fruit from the word of God. Jesus said that the words that he speaks are spirit and life. So, Father, I pray that you would send your spirit now and minister life to us from the words of Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen and amen. Well, the year was 146 B.C., it was two centuries before Paul would write his two letters to the church at Corinth. At that time, there was no Roman Empire yet, but the city of Rome was already powerful and ambitious. Rome was expanding towards the east. It was moving into the eastern Mediterranean, and it was squaring off in battle against a league of cities in Greece. The strongest of these was the city of Corinth. The Romans were eager to bring Greece under their power, under their control, and so they would teach Corinth a lesson that it would never forget. Rome's troops crushed the Corinthian army in battle, so much so that the Corinthians could not offer any more resistance. But the Roman general, a man named Mummius, was not in a mood to show mercy. After slaughtering the men of the city, he ordered Corinth to be destroyed, and so the city was burnt to the ground. Its wooden houses were consumed by the flames, and little of Corinth was preserved apart from the important buildings which were made out of marble. Other precious things which survived the fire like gold and silver were gathered up by the Roman conquerors. Corinth would then lie in ruins for a hundred years until it would start to be rebuilt by another Roman general named Julius Caesar. Two hundred years after the burning of Corinth, 
the Christians who received the letters of Paul there in the Corinthian church knew the story of the burning of Corinth very well. And perhaps Paul had that famous catastrophe in mind as he warned the Corinthians and us of a different kind of fire, one which all of us will someday face. You and I, as believers in Jesus, will one day face a fire that is much more significant when our deeds and our motives are inspected by the gaze of the Son of God, who has an all-consuming fire of holiness in his eyes. In the book of Revelation, John the Apostle had an incredible vision of Jesus, the King of glory, coming to judge the nations of the earth. John said, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. As we study what God revealed to John and Paul and the other prophets and apostles, we often see that same truth repeated, that Jesus is coming to judge the world in righteousness. It's a truth that is serious and sobering. But for the Christian, I want you to know it's also a truth that is very glorious and very encouraging. Let's take time today to answer five important questions, five important questions about the judgments of God and the judgment seat of Christ. First question we need to ask is this, why will God judge the world anyway? Why will God judge the world? God must judge, the Bible says, because he is holy. He is a holy God, and he will always uphold, demonstrate, and vindicate his holiness. Wickedness cannot exist in the presence of God. He cannot simply overlook evil as human beings often wish he would do. Habakkuk the prophet said, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and you cannot look upon wickedness. God is not like you and I are. He is so holy. He is so unique and different from you and me. The angels see him and they stand in awe of his holiness 24 hours a day. They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And because God is holy, he will always punish sin. If he did not do so, he would be unjust if he let sin go unpunished. He would cease to be God. That was the dilemma that Jesus solved upon the cross. How can a God who is holy receive men, receive people like you and me, who are sinful. The cross reveals the answer. Jesus, the Son of God, would bear the punishment for our sins. Somebody praise the Lord. Because of this, God is now free to cancel and send away the sin of everyone who receives the benefit of that sacrifice. God, because of what Jesus Christ did, can now receive us. And through the lens of Calvary, God can see us as being faultless. Hallelujah. However, if anyone will not come to God through the cross, the word of God is soberingly clear. Scripture says that the wrath of God remains. It abides upon that person because his sin has not been dealt with. And therefore, God will have no choice but to judge that sin. If he cannot punish your sin in Christ, he will have to punish it in you. He can't just overlook it. And so the holiness of God means that it is necessary to punish sin. It is necessary to punish Satan and fallen angels and demons. It is necessary to punish every crime that has escaped human punishment. Church, I want you to know that evil will not triumph in the end. Sometimes when we see things that go on in this world, yeah, amen. Sometimes when we see things that go on in this world, we are discouraged and tempted to say, well, those people are getting away with murder, whoever it is you don't like. 
But you know what, church? No one, no one ultimately will get away with anything. It's not going to happen. And if it isn't punished in Christ, then sadly, it will be punished in the perpetrator. Why does God judge? God will judge because he's holy. Second question we need to ask about the judgments of God is this. What is the judgment of God like? First, the judgment of God is certain. That's the first characteristic of God's judgments. The judgment of God is certain. Hebrews 10.30 says, We know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And the Lord will judge his people. Modern man thinks that he is a law unto himself. But there is a lawgiver above who has promised that a day will come when he will bring true and lasting righteousness to the earth. He is our creator and he has the right to demand and he will demand righteousness from every creature that he's made. Second characteristic of the judgment of God is that it is all-inclusive. Everyone will stand before God someday. Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists will see him. Atheists will see him. They will be cured. Each one of us will be summoned before the court. And you know what? The invitation does not have the little letters RSVP on the bottom. You will not be able to pick up the phone and say, I'm so sorry, Lord God, something came up. No, I'm afraid attendance will be mandatory. All of the saints and all of the villains of history will see his face. God says in his word, as surely as I live, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. A third characteristic of the judgment of God is that it is just. The judgment of God will be just. Millennia ago, Abraham asked the question, a rhetorical question. He said, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And Abraham knew the answer to that question very well. The answer is, yes, of course, he will do what is right. The judgments of God will be perfectly fair. On earth, we can't always say that what goes on in a court is perfectly fair, but no one will be able ever to say that they were not treated fairly by the Supreme Court of Heaven. Everything will be handled with complete and totally impartial justice. And fourth, the judgment of God is final. There will be no appeal from heaven's court, simply because there is no other court to which you can appeal. Think of all the people you know nowadays who say things like, who are you to judge me? Only God can judge me. I'm going to let God be my judge. Well, I think that may be the origin of the expression, be careful what you wish for. Sadly, such people who say those things will finally get their wish. And that will be the conclusion to everyone's calls for justice. How much better, though, if they had bowed the knee to Jesus while they were still here on earth so he could lovingly wash their sins away. We've asked why God judges and what the judgment of God is like. Now let's ask a third and truly sobering question. What is the judgment of unbelievers like? What is the judgment of unbelievers like? We read these words of John in Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works 
by the things which were written in the books. And you've been worried about the NSA. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, John says, and anyone who was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Church, Jesus is returning to rule this earth for a thousand years, a time that we call the millennium. Millennium is just a Latin word meaning a thousand year period. In those days, Israel and the nations will live under the leadership of Jesus Christ and the church will reign together with him. After a thousand years of peace, God will then transition the world into an eternal state of blessedness and perfection in his presence. Before he does that, he will summon all of the wicked dead to appear before the great white throne. Its dazzling brightness speaks of the purity of the one who sits upon it. His face is so awesome. The scripture says the universe itself must flee away, must shrink away because of the glory that emanates from his face and his person. Forget what Hollywood has taught you. This is not a judgment to decide whether or not a person is saved. There is no set of scales. There is no balance that is weighing your good deeds against your bad. The judgment of an unbeliever, hear me church please, the judgment of an unbeliever merely confirms what is already known. It merely ratifies what he has become. All the unbelievers of the ages will appear before the great white throne. They will be judged according to what they have done. But without the benefit of the blood of Jesus to plead on their behalf, they are condemned to the lake of fire. Without excuse, without appeal, but without the slightest hint of unfairness, they will be found guilty and sentenced accordingly. Church, what a fearful future awaits those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. How we need to pray for loved ones, for friends who have not yet bowed the knee to Jesus and who have yet to give him any of the glory that belongs to his name. That is the judgment of the unbeliever. But question number four is a little better. It's this, what is the judgment of the believer like? What is the judgment of the believer? Believers in Jesus will one day appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We read 2 Corinthians 5. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Thanks be to God, if you believe in Jesus, your judgment is not the same as the judgment of the unbeliever. The wicked dead can only expect wrath without mercy, but the dead in Christ will know mercy because Jesus knew the wrath of God. Oh, I'm not sure you got that. I better say that again. The wicked dead can only expect wrath without mercy, but the dead in Christ will know mercy because Jesus knew wrath. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him might not, and the forgotten word is perish, but have eternal life. I have good news for you today, church. Just like the judgment of the unbeliever, this is not a judgment that God will be holding in order to decide whether you are saved. You see, if you've given your heart to Jesus, that issue was already resolved and forgiveness has come. Romans 6, 23 says, because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Messiah Jesus, our Lord. Can I say something with you? I've already said enough, haven't I? Foolish jokes about heaven, foolish jokes and cartoons about St. Peter quizzing people at the pearly gates, they are an offense to the word of God. Listen, they cause people 
to hold on to a fleshly confidence that they are able to make it through those gates on their own efforts and nothing can be further from the truth. There will be no one there in that holy place who will be able to say, I made it in here without the blood of Jesus. Paul says in Ephesians 2, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And that was not of yourselves, not of your own doing. It was the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The best of us will not be able to boast that we have any merit to be in that place apart from the merits of Jesus Christ. So thank God this is not a judgment of the Christian worker, but it is a judgment of the Christian's works. Paul said in the portion we read, Now if anyone builds with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on and endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. What is the judgment of the believer like? Well, we can certainly see from Paul's description there that this is not the purgatory of the Roman Catholic Church. This is not a fire that is meant to purify the worker, but is meant to test his workmanship. Listen, church, understand me. We are already saved through the blood of Jesus. You are not saved by Jesus' blood, followed by centuries of suffering afterwards on your part. What an insult that is to the blood of Jesus. Can't believe he said that. Yeah, I said it. I want you to notice that there is no I want you to notice that there is no punishment that is mentioned in those verses and for good reason. You see, my sins were already punished. They were carried away by the savior on the cross. And if you don't understand that, then you haven't yet understood what the gospel is. The prophet Isaiah tells us, all of us, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have each wandered away down his own path. But the Lord has laid upon him, God the Father laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. Hallelujah. So this fire is designed to test our works and to see what kind of works we have done for the master and Christ will reward us for what he can see we have truly done for him. Bearing those things in mind, let's spend the rest of our time together looking at our fifth and final question about the judgments of God. What can I anticipate at the judgment seat of Christ? What can I anticipate at the judgment seat of Christ? When we stand in front of him and we meet his searing gaze of holiness, the word tells us what we can expect. expect. First, you can anticipate that men will be exposed. You can anticipate that men will be exposed. Not a lot of shouting here in the room so far, but you'll have a chance to amen later. Church, remember that Jesus will judge not only the things that we can see in a man, but what is within the man. All of our secrets will be laid bare. If Pastor Glenn were here, I know what he would say. He would say, I say this not to frighten you. I say this to terrify you. <laughs> All of your secrets will be laid bare. What you really thought about things. What you really loved. What you really despised. God in his mercy has not allowed us to read other people's minds. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. He has not allowed us to know such things. The Bible says, no man knows what is in the spirit of another man. But you know there is somebody who does know what's in the spirit of men. God does. Everything is open to him and nothing can be hidden from his sight. Hebrews 4.13 says, There is no creature that is hidden from his sight, but everything is naked and open to the eyes of the one to whom we must give account. 
That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is, who knows the word of God, which is hypocrisy. Because there is nothing that is covered that shall not be revealed. Neither is there anything hidden that shall not be known. You're doing it on the down low, it's going to come out up front in stage lights. All of our petty games that we play as human beings, all religious pretense, all of our posturing, it's all going to be burned to a crisp under the eyes of the living Christ. Sometimes people can be, you know, impenetrable walls to each other. They don't give anything away. You don't really ever know what they're thinking. Sometimes even your closest friends, you don't, you're not really quite sure what's going on up in there. But in front of the searching glory of the Lord, even the most closed mouth person is an open book. Even somebody that doesn't give anything away to you about what they're thinking, their inmost thoughts to the Lord can be heard as if they were being cranked out through this sound system that we have here. Church, how glad we all should be that our judge was first our savior. Second thing to anticipate at the judgment seat of Christ is this. Anticipate that men will be examined. You and I are going to be examined. Not only will everything be exposed and uncovered, it will then be examined in detail. The Bible says that this will be a thorough inspection. In Ecclesiastes 12, Solomon said this, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, because this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every, everybody say every. God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. How thorough is that? Well, Solomon says all of our works all of our secret works as well are going to be reviewed. That's good and bad. Both the times that we didn't quite measure up and the times also that we did some little secret thing to bless somebody else that nobody knew about except you and the Lord. It's all going to be reviewed by Jesus Christ. You see, what is the Lord teaching us? He wants us to know that everything you do, church, is important. Everything matters. Everything you do, no matter how small throughout the day, is being watched and noticed. And everything you do has a powerful capacity to impact the life of other people, either for good or for ill. And all of that will be brought out to the light. More than even our actions, Jesus says, we will give account for every idle word that we speak. If you can't say amen, say oh my right there. Every idle word that we speak, even as our hands have been given power by God to affect the natural world, so our tongues have been given an amazing capacity by God to affect the immaterial world, to kill, to make alive, to curse people, to heal people, to bless people. At the judgment seat of Christ, your tongue and my tongue will be up for review. Christ will judge our works He'll judge our words, but because he searches the hearts, he can also judge my motives. I know you're running for the exits, but it's going to be good. Listen, the courts of men can judge what you've done, but only Jesus Christ can judge why you did it. And he will. Very famous passage of, passage of scripture I know that many of you are familiar with. In Jeremiah 17.10, the Bible says, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Not very complimentary, is it? Many of us know that passage, but few people know that in the next verse, God answers the question. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Then it says, I the Lord... I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Church, let's be careful how we are laboring. Labor we must, but labor that is done for the gaze of others is a foundation of straw. 
it will not survive the fire of the gaze of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you like the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Our works, our secret works, your words, your motives, they will all be examined by the eyes of a holy God. What can we expect of the judgment seat of Christ? All right, everybody take a breath. Everybody exhale. Are you ready for some better news? What can you anticipate when you stand before the Lord? Anticipate that men will not only be exposed and examined, anticipate that men will be exalted. Men and women will be exalted on that day from Jesus. The Bible teaches us that God is a faithful wage payer. A faithful wage payer. Hallelujah. God is very clear that those who serve him faithfully are going to receive rewards. Some will receive grants of authority, notable positions of service in the eternal kingdom of God. You say, Pastor Nick, what does that look like? What kind of reward can God give? I mean, his headquarters has streets that are made out of solid gold, but nobody uses money. So what does that reward look like? We don't know. We don't have the complete picture. I'm not sure, but I'm very happy to leave it to the imagination and the creativity of an almighty God. See, my Bible says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men at any time the things that God has prepared for those who love him. I saw from our text that God is going to give us rewards based on the quality of our work. That doesn't mean that a little quantity would hurt us. See, the Bible says that God is looking for fruit, for much fruit, for fruit that remains. So I understand quality is not mentioned in the text, but that doesn't mean you can come out and do your one golden deed every year. We have to work and be fruitful for the Lord. Okay. That's all I want to say about that. But the fire of his gaze is going to test our works and see of what kind they are. If anybody's work is burned, he'll suffer loss, but he'll be saved. Will our works be found to be gold and silver, or will they be hay and stubble? Were they done out of love, or were they done for selfish motives? Were they done for gain, to get a position to receive the acclaim of men. Oh, you're so wonderful. Were we diligent? Were we faithful to him or were we half-hearted and sloppy in the way that we went about things? Was my heart full of the compassion of Jesus as I labored? Was it full of his joy or did I work out of a sense of obligation? Was it a drudgery to me? Did I just do it because that's what's expected of me? That's what a good person does. It seems like the thing to do in my position. The selfish works, which are wood, hay, and stubble, will be burned up. Notice that Paul says such a person would suffer loss but be saved. So I do want to remind you what we said earlier. This is not a judgment to decide whether we're saved, but it is for the Lord to reward you for what you did for him. Thank God if you're a believer, you will be there. Maybe some of us won't be dressed as gloriously as some others after the inspection is over. We might have deceived ourselves a little too much into thinking we were dressed in gold when in reality our suit was mostly made of hay. I don't know. We'll find out. But at least, praise the Lord, if you had a suit of hay, you're going to be there and you will still experience the joy of the Lord. You can sit with me. We will be up in the, the top row there in the upper deck of heaven getting a holy nosebleed. But we'll be there. You'll still be able to praise God because of his amazing grace. I wonder if that's why the Bible says God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. How could there be tears in heaven, people say? I think for a few moments after we step away, yes, Christ will reward us but you'll have that tinge of thought in your heart, if only. There was maybe something that I hadn't done, or maybe there was something that I had left undone that I could have done. 
what might have been the saddest, the poet said, the saddest of all possible words are these, it might have been. And you'll feel some of that on that day. But thank God, he will wipe away all the tears from your eyes. And he'll say to you, enter into the joy of your Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, but friends, you know what? It's so much better to work for Jesus now while we still have time and opportunity and gain some prizes that are everlasting. See, here on the earth, we often struggle to gain what is just temporary and fleeting. There's so much time and money and effort that gets expended to achieve things that, truthfully, the Bible says are simply going to go up in smoke someday. When you see Jesus... When you see the beauty and the glory of his father, when you are escorted into the heavenly realms, I have no doubt that many of our pressing concerns will in that moment seem so insignificant, so completely empty and vain. So if you're alive and breathing today still, God is giving you opportunity to work for him and to gain eternal commendation from the Son of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 that everyone who competes in athletics is working for a perishable crown, but we are working for a crown that will not ever fade away. We have the Bible's assurance that those works which are not consumed by fire will be richly rewarded by a good and a generous God. God's word says that there are going to be degrees or levels of rewards for the faithful believers. Just as there are degrees of punishments in hell, so there will also be degrees of reward in the kingdom of God. We don't know precisely how it works, as I said, but every person's reward will be uniquely their own. And undoubtedly, some of us will have rewards that are more glorious than some of our fellows. Luke spoke in, uh, Jesus spoke in Luke 19 about one man ruling over five cities, another man ruling over ten cities. You say, well, Pastor Nick, that was a parable. You know, that's symbolic language. We can't go by that. I understand that. But we also do know that the Bible says when the Lord returns that the saints are going to reign with him. In Revelation 20, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. And I trust that's you and me. Over that, such a person, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. In the Gospels, you know, Jesus promised the 12 that in the kingdom they would sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That is the reward that Jesus will give to his faithful apostles. God said in the book of Ezekiel that in the kingdom age that David will be the prince over Israel ruling under the Messiah. Imagine that. Surely God is going to know how best to apportion out positions of authority in his kingdom, even if it's somewhat mysterious to us today. Just think, you might have come into this worship service today, and without realizing it, you are sitting next to the future king of the Bronx. Not only are there going to be grants of authority within Christ's kingdom, but there are also going to be special crowns. We can read about several of them in the New Testament letters. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is laid up in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. Do you love righteousness and long for his appearing? Is there something in your spirit that disturbs you when you watch the news and you see what goes on in the world, the horrific crimes, what people do to the elderly, what people do to children, all the things, the terrible things and wars that go on in other nations? Does that bother you? Do you sometimes look at the world and say, come, Lord Jesus? Jesus, would you come and straighten this old ridiculous world out? If so then there may be a crown of righteousness that Jesus will award you someday.
There are other different crowns that you may receive that are going to advertise to others about what your life was like, about your walk, about the kind of victorious warfare that you waged while you were living on this earth. You know, it's going to be a great conversation starter in the kingdom of God. You know, on this earth, it's like, girl, where did you get those shoes? <laughs> but up there, it's going to be, wow, Tony, tell me about your crown. I see that you have a crown of rejoicing. Tell me how you got it. Tell me what Jesus said to you when he handed you that crown that day. It's going to be awesome. Imagine the testimonies. Imagine the rejoicing. You won't be able to walk down the sidewalk in heaven. Every 10 minutes, somebody will be stopping you. You'll be stopping them. You'll be talking about how Jesus brought you through, how he gave you that crown because you made it through. The New Testament speaks of a couple of different kinds of crowns. One crown is the crown that kings wear. In Greek, it's called the diadema. And that's where we get, of course, our English words, you can imagine, diadem. Now, ladies, you'll understand this, that the crown of kings, the diadem in the ancient world, was a band of gold. It went across your forehead and was held in place by the tension of that band. It was not the big, heavy, circular crown that we put on top of the heads of kings and queens nowadays. That was not invented for centuries after that. Those crowns that we have today did not exist until later. What they had in the ancient world was the diadem-type crown. And Revelation 19 says that Jesus is crowned with many of these crowns. Now remember, these crowns were bands, and each band that you wore would signify that you had authority in a certain kingdom. So some of the kings in the ancient world, sometimes they wore two or three of these to signify countries that they had captured and so forth. But you know what? John said that Jesus is crowned with many crowns. And I know why. See, the Bible says that he has all authority in heaven and all authority in earth. And under the earth, the Bible says he's Messiah, King of Israel. He's the head of the church. He's the captain of the host of angels. And he's the king of glory. So I gave you seven right there for those of you that like to find all the sevens in the Bible. There's a perfect seven for you. Only Jesus wears the diadem. No man no Christian man wears it. It's a kingly crown, and it belongs to King Jesus alone. You know, the beast of Revelation wears a diadem also because he's trying to counterfeit King Jesus. But that begs the question, what is the crown then that Christians receive? What is the crown that you will take from the hands of Jesus? That's a different word entirely. The Greek word is stephanos. And it's not the kingly crown. The Stephanos is the victor's crown. It's the victor's crown. Now, if your name, I don't know if anybody in the room today is named Stephen, but if your name is Stephen, you are named for that crown. How about that? What is the Stephanos crown? It was a wreath of leaves that were woven together, not a crown of gold. This was the crown that was given to the victors in the ancient Olympic Games. Back then, Alan, Olympic champions did not receive a gold medal. You know what they received? They received a crown of olive leaves and a pot of olive oil. I thought the Olympics were in Greece, not Italy, right? Isn't that interesting? A crown of olive leaves and a pot of olive oil. Maybe Paul, by sharing this with us, wanted us to think about how we overcome and get that crown through the strength and the supply of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. The Stephanos crown was awarded to people on other occasions too, and all of them speak to us of the joy that we will someday possess. It was given to people to celebrate the value that they had to the city. Wouldn't that be awesome to have Jesus come and say that to you? Here is the crown which I am giving to you to recognize that you were of tremendous value to the kingdom of God. Can you imagine? It was awarded also for bravery, for military valor. 
It was given to people when they were celebrating joy at a wedding and other happy feasts. I like all of those. Now, perhaps what I said a little earlier will make a little more sense to you. Paul had said that athletes compete for a perishable crown, but we are competing for an imperishable crown. And every athlete who won the games in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, his crown would fade away. But in heaven, you're going to have an eternal crown to lay at his feet and say, Jesus, I only made it here because of your grace. Hallelujah. Pastor Jason, you can come back and help us if you would. Hallelujah. Thank God, church. Someday you can get a victor's crown because there came a day when Jesus took off his kingly crown. He took off his diadem and he came into the world. And one day he did wear the woven crown, a crown that men had made with their hands. And it was a crown of thorns. And because he wore that victor's crown, you can win a victor's crown as well. The Bible says there's a crown of righteousness for those who live right and long for his appearing. The Bible says there's a crown of rejoicing for those who win souls. How many of you want that? That's a good one to have. The Bible says there's a crown of life for people who endure temptation and endure persecution. That's not one that a lot of us are signing up for, but it'll be a blessed one if you get it. The Bible says there's a crown of glory for people who faithfully feed the flock of God. Some people say that's a pastor's crown. That's not what it means. You don't have to be a pastor to get that crown. It means that if there are people that God has put into your life to take care of in the kingdom of God, and you take care of them, and you feed them, you don't need to be in a pulpit. But if you shepherd those people that God gives to you, you can receive a crown of glory. Church, there's a glorious crown to be one for Jesus. Besides a crown, the Bible also talks about special rewards that Jesus will give to the overcomers, for the ones who prevail over sin, to the ones who prevail over circumstances and over everything that hell has thrown at them. They overcome the devil by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the lamb, and they overcome because they love Jesus more than they love their own life. They're overcomers. And if Jesus considers you to be in that category, then he has some good things to say to you in the book of Revelation. He says, if you're an overcomer, you'll get to eat from the tree of life. He says, if you're an overcomer, he says, I'm going to give you authority to rule over the nations. And he says, and this blows my mind, he says, if you overcome, I will grant it to you to sit down with me in my throne just as I overcame and I have sat down with my father in his throne. Wow. What does that look like? Can you imagine what that looks like? Are you busy this afternoon? Yes. I'm scheduled from noon till three to run the universe with Jesus because I'm an overcomer. You ought to spend some time reading the book of Revelation today, not because you think it would make a cool action movie, okay? But so that you can see what Jesus says to you in there. How much in that book Jesus is encouraging you to keep going, to keep pressing on, to hold on, because he's got a great reward for you if you make it. Thank God, church, what a great promise of reward we have. Church, it's time to work for Jesus like never before. Work for him today. Work for him now because pretty soon it's going to be too late to do any more work for him of any quality and we'll be undergoing that final inspection listen church we know none of us is perfect and some of what all of us have done i'm sure will just turn out to be wood but he's a faithful god he's a faithful wage payer and he encourages us to work because everything we do for him no matter how small no matter how seemingly insignificant it's being taken down everything that you do in his name is going to be amply rewarded the bible says therefore don't cast away your confidence which has in it a great hope of reward god is not unfaithful the bible says to forget your labor he hasn't forgotten any of the work that you've done 
He hasn't forgotten any of your sacrifice. He hasn't forgotten any of your service for him. The Bible says he doesn't forget any of your tears. They're all written down in his book. He saves them up. He's got all your tears collected. He hasn't forgotten any of your giving. He hasn't forgotten any of your prayers. He hasn't forgotten all the little kindnesses that you've done to people that nobody knew except you and him. There's a cloud of witnesses that is pulling for you to make it, pulling for you to overcome when you face temptation. Jesus, the son of God himself, is standing up at times out of his seat, looking at your life with intense interest and love and passion and saying, you be faithful to me even unto the point of death and I will give you a crown of life. Commit your heart, commit your heart, church, to Jesus completely today. Commit that whatever time, whatever energy you have left on this planet belongs only to him and that you're going to give him your heart and your soul and if necessary in his cause, your body as well, if need be, to serve him. This is the promise of the word of God that as we place our trust in him, the Bible says he is able to keep you from falling and he's able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceedingly great joy. If you truly work for Jesus, he's going to present you. He's going to introduce you to the father faultless. Can you imagine that? My child, yes, Jesus, I would like you to meet the father. What a meeting. Jesus will present you to the Father faultless with exceeding joy. Let your works be gold and silver and precious stones. And then you can be truly joyful at the judgment seat of Christ. All of our trials, all of the things that you're going through, even right at this moment that were vexing your mind when you walked in the door today, all of it will have been worth it all when he looks you in the eye and says, well done you good and faithful servant. Come on, stand to your feet and let's give Jesus a praise. Come on, thank him. Come on, if he saved you. Come on, if he saved you, give him thanks. Oh, come on, make a praise to him today. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He's so good to his people. Come on, I want us to lift our hands and we're going to sing that song we were singing in worship. Lord, I give you my heart give you my soul. And you know what? Use this as a vehicle to tell the Lord that whatever time you have left in this life, that it belongs to him. Come on, sing. This is my desire. your way, Lord Jesus. We exalt you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, that you're still working on us. You receive us. I thank you, God, that your people are going to make it. I thank you, Lord, that your word says that you who began a good work in us, you will be faithful to keep performing it until the day of Jesus Christ. So we can receive your commendation, Lord. Let's close our eyes in his presence. If you're here today and you're not sure that you even have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to ask Jesus to forgive your sins and reign as king and Lord over you. You heard what I said today about judgment, you know? That's how we can avoid being in dread at the thought of seeing God. God loves you. He does not want to be your judge. He would so much rather be your savior. You can have joy in his presence for all eternity. Be welcomed into his heavenly kingdom with a great fanfare. But the way in is to come to Jesus for cleansing from sin. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So we're all going to pray together now. We're going to pray a prayer of invitation, asking God to change us, to take away our sin and cleanse us. 
through the power of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And as we do that, I hope that you'll pray with us to receive Jesus and his forgiveness. Come on, repeat this prayer with me if that's what you want. Say, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I need your forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I confess that you are Lord. And I turn from my own ways now. I believe that God raised you from the dead to save me. So forgive my sins and fill me with your spirit. Give me a new life. Let me be born again. Fill me with your spirit and help me to walk with you every day. Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise. Come on, give him thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If this is the first time that you've ever prayed a prayer like that, then right after we conclude our service with prayer in just a couple of minutes, I want to invite you to come to the front. There'll be some folks that'd love to meet you, pray with you, and we have some materials that we'd love to put into your hand that will help you to get started in a new life of following Jesus. All right. For everybody else that's here in the room, how many of you want to have a good reward? You want to be able to present to the Lord gold and silver and precious stones. Let's pray together. I want to ask you to lift your hands up to the Lord, and we're going to pray. We're going to recommit our hands to the Lord. Come on. Lord, we recommit our hands to you today that we may serve you faithfully with them, Lord. Father, I pray, we all pray, Lord, that you would use our lives for your purpose and for your glory. Jesus, our strength, our life, our hands belong to you, and we give you our strength. I just sense today that there's people that have been struggling, saying, I'm too old. There's not much labor that I can do for the Lord anymore. Or I'm sickly, I'm infirm, it doesn't matter. You know, you can do more for God many times even with your prayers there in your room by yourself than we can do with all the strength and vigor of a 25 year old. Keep working for Jesus. Don't think that you don't have a contribution to make to the advancement, to the building up of his kingdom. Lord, we say that we give you our time no matter how much time you give us remaining on this earth. We give you that time, Lord, to work and to pray and to bless and encourage others. Now, I want you to take a minute, just tell him in your own words that you want to serve him like never before. You don't need me to lead you in that prayer. You just tell him yourself that you want to be his servant, his handmaid. Go on, tell him that. I want you to take your hands out. I want you to put your hands on your head. Put your hands on your mind, on the seat of your thinking. Father, we recommit our minds to you today. Lord, we give you our thought life once again. What we're thinking, Lord. Would you straighten out our thinking? Father, would you help your people to fill their minds? Lord, help us to fill our minds once again with the word of God. Some of us, we need to recall what God told Joshua. He said, this word, this book of the law shall not depart from in front of your eyes, but in it you will meditate day and night, and then you will have good success. So Lord, we return to the word of God, and we pray, Father, that you would let your word adjust and correct and change our thinking. Lord, the way that we look at things, our grid, the glasses that we see life through, Lord, would you alter it through your word? Some of you came in here with a personality that you don't even like. You know what? God can change you. God can make you into a different person, give you a different outlook on things. When you pull into the parking lot, when they see you pulling into work tomorrow, they're not all going to run or go to the water cooler or the bathroom because they see you coming. You're going to be a better person to be around because God's even going to change your personality. One more. Place your hands over your heart. Lord, we give you our hearts once again. We see in your word, Lord, we heard in your word today that you know the thoughts and intents of our hearts and you know our motivations. So, Lord, we pray that you would purify our hearts. Come on, our motives. Ask the Lord right now. Say, Lord, just examine me. And, Lord, examine my motives. Maybe you've had some impure motives in some areas of life. Maybe you've had a mixed motive. 
Maybe it was some of God and some of you. The Lord knows that. And he wants to give us space to repent. So we pray like King David prayed. We say, Lord, create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit, a proper spirit, a steadfast spirit within our hearts. Father God, we don't want to bring you wood, hay, and stubble. We want to bring you precious things, Lord. We want to bring you a heart of love. We want to bring you a heart of gold that's been transformed by the love of Jesus Christ. The Father, we pray that you'd help us to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all our mind and strength. Hallelujah. Come on, give him thanks. Bless you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Come on, sing it one more time. Come on, Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you 